commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions of 1949. What are the importance of these laws? The Geneva Conventions in 1949 are very significant. But I think we should remember that the law of armed conflict has really been regulated by international law for thousands of years. Um, in many ways, it started out from you know, religious beliefs and religious doctrine. And although it's been 60 years since the 1949 Geneva Conventions, I think it's worth bearing in mind that the historically first Geneva Convention will celebrate its 145th anniversary on the 22nd of August of this year. That was the 1864 Geneva Convention for the amelioration of the conditions of the wounded in armies in the field. It's really since the, the, the mid-19th century that we've had the development of the modern law of armed conflict and in, in many ways the most recent addition to the Geneva Instruments is Additional Protocol 3 of 2005. Uh, that entered into force in 2007. Uh, Protocol 3 is a very short instrument which introduces a new protective sign, the Red Crystal, uh, to take its place alongside the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. Some states were uncomfortable using the Cross or the Crescent because they believed that they had religious connotations. The Red Crystal has no religious connotations and so therefore it should be, you know, should be acceptable to all states. Um, I think it's worth saying that, that Israel is a party to the additional Protocol 3. It wasn't the only state that had problems with using the cross or the crescent. For instance, pre-revolutionary pre -revolutionary Iran used a line and a sun symbol. What are the major challenges the Geneva Conventions facing in their 60s? I think the main challenge to the Geneva Conventions of 1949 really has to do with the changed nature of warfare. The Geneva Conventions were built on the assumption that the armed conflict would involve two states and their uniformed armies in conflict. Although those sorts of conflicts still occur, uh, it is much more common nowadays that what we have is the army of a state against non-state irregular armed forces who possibly don't wear uniforms. Um, this, this gives rise to a number of problems. Um, for instance, one is the problem of detention. I mean, if a state captures irregular forces from a non-state actor, what are the proper ways in which they should be treated? I think we should also remember that that does have a converse. If irregular forces capture a, a member of the opposing state armed forces, how should they treat that person? And these, these are questions which are equally important. Um, one of the other changes, you know, because of this changed nature of warfare, which is no longer between two states, but often between states and irregular forces, are what we might call the changed nature of the battle space. It's maybe no longer occurring in fields you know, where you've got armies going after each other. Uh, it's sometimes called the shrinking of humanitarian space. Warfare now can take place in more urban settings. And this causes problems particularly for civilians who are not taking part in the conflict. You know, old people, children, women, the rest of them. Um, one of, you know, one of the, the big problems here is where can civilians be safe? Now, if you look at the recent conflict in Gaza, Geneva Convention 4 allows for the creation of safe zones and hospital zones where civilians and the wounded and sick you know, will be safe, they won't be subject to hostilities. However, these were not created in Gaza, even after when yeah, Israel took control over part of the territory. Safe zones for civilians and hospital zones for the sick and wounded were not created, and I think that that is a, that is a problem. Uh, according to this, the Geneva Conventions are not being respected. What are the means or the ways to enforce them? Enforcement of the, the provisions of the Geneva Conventions really lie on two different levels. One is the state-to-state -state level, and the other is the question of, of individual responsibility. If we start with relationships between states, um, as was stated authoritatively 
by the International Court of Justice in the World Advisory Opinion in 2004, all states parties to the Geneva Conventions have the duty not simply to respect the Geneva Convention themselves, but also to ensure that other states parties respect the Conventions. Now this really means that if a, party, a state party to the Geneva Conventions breaches those Conventions, that the other states have a duty to try and bring that state back into a situation where it is complying with the conventions. Okay. The other level of enforcement is in relation to individuals and the imposition of individual criminal responsibility for um, acts which are against the conventions. Now, each of the four 1949 19 conventions and indeed additional protocol one provides for what are called grave breaches. These are seen as particularly serious breaches of the conventions. All states parties have a duty to find people who have, who have, who have committed grave breaches of the conventions and prosecute them. It is a form of universal jurisdiction. So regardless of where grave breaches occurred, all the other parties have a duty to prosecute. Now, in a way, um, <coughs> excuse me, in a way, the, the, the grave breach provisions of the Geneva Conventions have now been supplemented by the provisions of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Because the Rome Statute makes some of these grave breaches international crimes which can be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court in the last resort. This, the international criminal law is really a fairly new area of international law. It's just developing. But it is a big change and it should be, um, I hope, a major tool in trying to ensure that the Geneva Conventions are respected. We will join you with this hope and thank you very much. For thank you very much.